everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on the proper use of shackles. My name is Gisela Clark. I'm the Social Media Specialist at Columbus McKinnon, and will be your host today for our webinar. Today's webinar on shackles is part two of a three-part rigging series. Today you will learn how to properly inspect, select, and use shackles. Presenting today will be Peter Cook, our training manager. He specializes in rigging and load securement. Peter has been a dedicated uh, 15 years to Columbus McKinnon as an engineer, designing engineered lifts, slings, and forgings. He's traveled throughout the world teaching proper rigging techniques, rigging gear inspection, and hoisting crane inspection and maintenance. Also on the call today is Travis Cobb. He's a design engineer from our CM Forge operations, and he'll be assisting Peter with questions at the end of our session today. A few quick, quick points. <clears throat> Excuse me, before we get started, as I said, we are recording the session today, and the recording link will be provided on our YouTube channel, as well as being emailed to everyone who registered and or attended. Everyone has been muted, so we encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A pane on the right side of your page. We'll take five minutes of questions at the end of our session, and those that don't get answered, we will personally respond back to within 24 hours after our webinar. Thank you for your attention, and now I'll turn the meeting over to Peter so we can begin. All right, thank you everybody for attending, and uh, we'll get started. And today's topics uh, we'll, we'll try to get through to in the next uh, 45 minutes is define shackle types and configurations, shackle identification and markings, shackle inspection, safe rigging practices with shackles, and then we'll just take some general questions uh, that you have at the end. So uh, just to start, um, all CM shackles meet, are made from specially bar quality material and comply with ASTM A322, ASTM A576, or ASTM A921. And we also meet U.S. government specifications RRC271, ASME B30.26, uh, the EN standards, ISO, DNV type. Um, galvanized shackles meet ASTM A153 and B675, and pins and bolts meet SAE J429 and ASTM A354. So a lot of quality um, goes into our shackles, and uh, we do extensive um, testing on them to be sure that they're safe to use out in our marketplace. So at the start, we have different types of shackles, and uh, just to quickly go over those, we have a screw pin anchor shackle, um, as you can see just has a screw pin. There's no um, bolt and nut at the end. The actual threaded goes into the body of the shackle, and that's usually the rigger favorite because it can easily be um, unassembled and reattached easily in the field. Um, we have the bolt nut cotter style, which is uh, does have the bolt nut and cotter, as you can see there. And then we have the uh, chain shackle or the D shackle, which is a, uh, a smaller type shackle um, and more compact, and uh, we'll get into those as, as well and, and how those are used. So let's start off, when do we use a screw pin anchor shackle? Again, it's for easy removal. It's usually the rigger's favorite. Um, you don't have to have any tools with you out in the field. It does have a hole in the pin head there, and that is for a spanner wrench. So in the event, um, it does get a little locked up that you can put your spanner in there and un undo the pin. Um, but where, you, uh, where it's going to be a semi-permanent connection, these are more for, um, for uh, temporary connections, but it's semi permanent connection is a permanent connection, we want to move to the bolt nut cotter type. Um, this way we know it's secured on the load. You must have that cotter pin in place as well to prevent the bolt from backing off. Um, so if you're going to leave this on a piece of equipment or, or leave it um, where you're always going to be connecting to it, where you don't want to keep taking the shackle on and off, um, this is what we recommend that you use. Both the same shackle bias, just the pin design is a little bit different. When you want a smaller, more compact shackle, then we uh, use what we know as the D shackle, or we call them chain shackles, and they're more for direct inline loading or where you need a, a smaller body shape, um, and that's where we recommend these type of shackles. But its applications are similar. Okay. Okay, and then this shackle here. Um, it's called a round pin shackle. Okay, this has no threaded connections at all, um, and this is more of our load securement or towing applications, um, tensioning things of that nature. 
there's no threaded connection, there's no threads within the body of the shackle or on the pin, it just has a cotter key going through it. It's really not recognized by ASME B30.26, and so we do not recommend this shackle for overhead lifting. We feel that the threaded connection shackles are their best bet for overhead lifting. Um, in the event um, you were to lift something and something were to strike that pin, all you have is a cotter key holding that in place. Um, and so we, we, we'll steer, we steer people, people towards the threaded connected type of shackle. Okay? With that said, there are shackles are made of, of from three material types: um, carbon, super carbon, which is um, specific to CM only shackles, and then we have alloy shackles. All have different working mode limits, and all can be used for overhead lifting. Some of the confusion that we get um, because we are a chain manufacturer in the chain industry, we can only use alloy chain for overhead lifting. Well, shackles are not chain. Um, you, you are allowed to use carbon, super carbon, or alloy. It's what, whatever your preference or the application that you are going to apply that shackle to is how you choose that. And we'll go over a little bit about um, pros and cons of, of using each of those. Okay. But however, with that in mind, that, that we have three different materials, we never want to go by um, the diameter of the shackle as to, okay, we, all, we have all one-inch shackles or seven-inch shackles. They must all be the same working load limit. We need to look at the embossings on the shackle to identify the working limit because you are going to have different working load limits with the same diameter size, size given that there are different materials that they're made from. So uh, here's a side-by-side -side chart showing the different types of uh, materials that shackles can be made out of. And let's just take half-inch so you can see in the carbon. Uh, let me highlight that for you. But in the carbon here, uh, half inch, good for two ton. Super carbon is good for three ton. And the alloy shackle, good for 3.3 ton. And we look at the design factors. Carbon shackle that our, we manufacture is a five to one. The super carbon, we actually have a six to one design factor. And our alloy is a five to one design factor. Okay. So the big difference between, the, between them. And you want, again, you want to start looking at markings. And the markings are huge today. Um, understanding what those markings mean and why we put them on there, and it just ensures quality inspections, safety, and that the riggers are, are using safe equipment and can identify their equipment properly. So when do I want a super carbon versus a carbon? Uh, if you're just, you know, nothing special and uh, just general type of lifting, you know, I'm sure carbon will be fine. Uh, if you need a higher wor working load limit um, with the same size shackle, then you want to move up to the super carbon. Hey, I, don't, I can't use that larger shackle because it may not fit properly, but I need a higher working limit. And then you, go, you step up to the super carbon. Um, you, again, you can go to a small or, or vice versa. We need something smaller. You, go, you can go to the super carbon um, instead of stepping, you know, going to the next higher carbon size. Um, a higher work, look, working limit without the expensive alloy because alloy shackles are a little bit more expensive. So if you, you, know, you want to save a few dollars, you know, stick with the super carbon. Um, anytime the user isn't required by to use something else, you know, we recommend super carbon. Uh, and again, a higher safety factor. Alloy shackles, uh, when you need um, an RRC rated, that's a government rated shackle, which meets certain quality standards. So um, there'll be military specs and things of that out there that require government rated shackles. Um, so we'll have those, those for you. When you need increased toughness, now toughness is a combination of strength and ductility. Um, so alloy is, is it probably has the best toughness around. Um, so in cold weather applications that will hold up a lot better, and then also uh, resist shock loading. And I'll have a few slides showing that coming up. Alloy bolt nut cotter shackles are 100% proof tested. Um, again, higher working load limits, but need the same shackle size, or you need a smaller shackle with higher working load limits. You know, then you go to the alloy. So all depends your applications, how things fit. Um, and what environment that you're putting it in, that why you would choose one over the other. So here um, we have a comparison of our super carbon versus just a, a regular carbon shackle, just to uh, show out there. And again, CM is the only one that has uh, super carbon shackles. And again, this is a, this is the uh, what is called toughness, and toughness relates to the strength of the shackle. And really, it's a combination of uh, strength and ductility. And so it, what it results is it's very resistant to, to shock loading, so it holds up a lot better. And uh, we have a video on, on our blog, and I'll show you how to get to that blog, where you can watch a video of um, the super strong shackle being compared to a carbon in a, in a shock loading test. 
But you know, of course, we do want to avoid shock loading. I do want to mention that, but we realize that things happen out in the field. So the more safety you can have um, where, where it does happen, that it will you know try to prevent any type of failure. Shackle identification and marking. So what do all these markings on this shackle mean? And that's important as a rigger. The very first thing you need to do as a rigger is inspect that shackle. What's the markings on there? Who is it made from? Um, is it the right size that you need? And CM right now is, has a, is coming out with enhanced identification markings. Uh, the forged identification markings on the shackles will be the largest and the most user-friendly on the market. Um, more lar the larger, the more legible it will become. Um, improves operator safety by reducing the risk of users misreading or unable to read important size and workload information. Um, reduces replacement costs by decreasing the necessary of out-of-service issues due to worn or illegible markings. Because if it's not marked and you can't read it, um, you have to take it out of service. So you'll have a longer, longer life of using the shackle. So it makes it easy to identify as a CM shackle that it's a, a good quality shackle. And so. What is, what is required by ASME, the industry standard V30.26, name or trademark of the manufacturer. And you can see a number one there, the CM logo. You should know who it's made from, a reputable manufacturer. I've seen shackles out there that say China, and that's it. Um, I'm sure China is not the manufacturer of that shackle. So who do you go to when you need technical information or um, something happens? How do you, how do you, who, who's that person you talk to when you're in that bind? Okay, we spend all thousands and thousands of dollars on our rigging, mobile cranes, uh, hoisting equipment, and uh, the shackle is just as important. It may be not as expensive, but it is part of the lifting system, and so why would you skimp when it comes down to the lift point or the shackle? Uh, number two, the rated load. Of course, that needs to be on there, how much it can lift, and the size and the diameter of the body, which also will be stamped. And then we also have a, <clears throat> a trace code which internal to CM is a three-digit trace code, so it's, it means something to us. So if there was a problem, we, we can get those trace codes and track it back. <clears throat> also, what's new now um, is a raised surface that a lot of customers are requesting to put serial numbers on shackles. So now they will have the ability to put serial, serialize their shackles for inspection purposes and quality and, and um, to be sure that Rigor has an, a good shackle in service. But even the pins are marked. So how do you know if the pin is the right pin? Well, the pin has to have the, the manufacturer logo, as you can see here. Okay, It has to have um, HS, which is, stands for high strength, and also a trace code on the pin. Now, that's important because we have three different types of shackles, right? So what if the pins got mixed up? Well, how do I know what was on the alloy, or how do I know what was for the supercarbon or the carbon? Well, in this case, it doesn't matter. All our pins are high strength. So we design the same pins for all our shackles as far as size for size, so that if the, at the end of the day you had three uh, one-inch shackles, all of different material, let's say you had a carbon, a supercarbon, and an alloy, and those pins got mixed up, that would that it wouldn't matter because the CM has all the same um, pins that you don't have to worry about strength level of pins. All the strength level of pins are the same. But even the pins are marked. So start out. That, that means something, right? So that now you know that that pin is a quality pin and it's not an aftermarket or someone just threw something in there. So all those markings mean something. And so here you can see um, CM, which is, you know, of course, Columbus McKinnon, has a trace code and HS for high strength. Okay. Again, that's important. Um, I know the forging plant right now is changing the styles of their pins so they're more efficient, they thread in, fit easier, um, great connections, um, so they're working hard to um, make it more user friendly and have great engagement at, at all times throughout the manufacturing process and to get out into the field so that it's, it's a good quality shackle. And I'm very impressed with the shackles that CM ha is coming out today. I think they're one of the best in the industry and uh, just all in all a very impressive shackle um, compared to um, five, six years ago, I, I think I, 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 it doesn't even compare. They, they're the, I think right now the best looking shackles and uh, quality shackles on the market. All right, inspection criteria. So now what about, we, we got through what all those marking mean, means. We, we chose the right shackle, but now we want to be sure it's safe to use. So that's our next step as a rigger. And, and so we want to go through and inspect it before we use it. So a visual inspection shall be performed. Um, and where it's in a location where you can't get to or it's not feasible to inspect every lift, um, you have to at least do a periodic inspection on those shackles. So at least once a year, you should be looking at that or more. 
depending on the severity of service. So it might be uh, three, four times a year. Um, but, but in reality, if you're if you're applying the shackle um, for a rig, you, it's not not a big deal to inspect it. You should be inspecting it and being sure it's safe to lift. So, a, what is a periodic inspection? It's a complete inspection of the shackle shall be performed by a designated person and not to exceed one year. But um, written records are not required. I teach people in our training, just look it over when you, and all your rigging equipment, when you use it as best you can, do a frequent inspection, look it over, be sure it's safe to use, understand what you're looking at. Um, you're just going to be a, make a more safe lift. And so what are the rejection criteria? So we're looking for where, any part more, more than 10% of the original dimension, any kind, type of distortion, distortion, twisting, stretch, elongation, cracked, or broken components when you you know if, you, if you're in doubt take it out of service um, look for excessive pit corrosion and indications of heat damage uh, the markings all have to be there if you can't read the markings or you're not sure what it, you know is that a one ton or a one and a half ton um, it's got to come out of service you just you don't take take the guesswork right out of it and remove it uh, look for body spread um, you'll know that especially in a screw pin because it'll be very tough to um, thread in so um, the bolt nut cutter, you know, may not line up properly. It'll be tough to get the pin out. Um, look for uh, makeshift pins. Now that you all know what the pins look like, you can look for any substandard pins. And then also any field modifications, any type of welding, or someone um, did something they weren't supposed to to the shackle that caused you concern, uh, take it out of service. Again, if it was designed to have a cutter pin, it must be there in place and in good working condition. So if you have a bolt nut cutter type, and it's missing the cotter, um, you need to get a cotter in there before you use it for rigging. And just some pictures of things that we find in, during our inspections. Common in shackles, uh, people like to grind the eyes because they don't fit properly. And uh, instead of getting the next size up, they'll grind the eyes to make it fit. So that's not good. Uh, you know, believe me, we have enough material in there to hold a load. And by removing material, you can, you're creating stress risers. And it's, uh, who knows what it's good for at this point. Uh, again, pin, substandard pins, cracks, elongated eyes, they, those will start to get worn over time. So we need to be aware of that as a rigger. Um, again, just certain things we found grinding and um, where over, you know, this the shackle off to the left, overload, I mean, just extreme deformation there. Um, get it out of service. Anytime you suspect it, you overloaded it, or someone has overloaded it, take it out of service. So, all right, so now we've selected our shackle, uh, we've inspected it, and our next step would be to rig with it. So how do we rig proper with it? All right, so usually why, why do things, rigging accidents happen? We usually select the wrong gear, gear is worn, uh, it's used incorrectly, or the operator is not trained. So things like that in those pictures should never happen. And if I'm doing an inspection for somebody and I find rigging equipment like this, um, I know that their riggers or their operators need to be trained properly because they're doing something wrong or they selected something wrong and the application is the wrong fit for whatever they're using. So as with any rigging operation, no matter what you're choosing, whether it's shackles or swivel hoist rings, chains, synthetics, wire ropes, you need to know how much weight you're lifting, where your center of gravity is, the number of attachment points, angle of loading, the share of load on those points, and the conditions that you're working in. <laughs> Excuse me. Shackles can be used from 400 degrees Fahrenheit down to negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you go any temperatures beyond those, contact the manufacturer of the shackle to see what the rating would be used in those environments. Screw pin shackles are great to be used as a gathering ring. Um, so we're going to connect multiple slings to it. Um, in the entertainment industry, that's common, where they have uh, drops and they, they connect various slings to it to get their points. And uh, we do it in construction uh, for synthetic slings to connect synthetic slings to make a bridle assembly. And so that's what a, another use of a shackle, not only as a, as a lift point on a load, but also as a, get, as a gathering point for slings. But we want to avoid bunching on the slings. D-shaped shackles, as we mentioned before, are more for inline loading. And we really don't want to see side loading on D-shaped shackles. So um, they're great. They're, they're nice and compact. and, and easy to use for tight spaces, but you really want to use those for uh, straight poles. You don't want to have a shackle orientate itself in the wrong, um, in the wrong orientation. You know, everything, you, you try to remain everything in line. 
Um, and so that will weaken and damage the shackle. Eye bolts, um, eye bolts are always used incorrectly. Many times they're not, you know, in this picture here, you see the eye bolts aren't lined up properly. Um, and they're directly connecting a hook into the eye bolt, which is going to create a side load on those. So it, it's a very dangerous situation because they could snap off. Um, so if you're going to connect any type of eye bolt connection, you want to throw a shackle in there first and then connect to your hook. Uh, be sure that you're using the correct eye bolts. Um, they're seated properly and in line with your sling tension. And then that, that's a proper application. And always um, take your reductions when you're looking at angles. Again, that's something we teach in our rigging seminars, how to take reductions versus angles on eye bolts and uh, other rigging equipment. So there are many ways to connect in different uses of a shackle. Um, here we see a chain loop through a shackle, which uh, a lot of people will do. And then we have to worry about the D2D, or we can do that with a wire rope. Again, we have to worry about D2D reductions. Um, we'll talk about that. Um, directly connect with a hook, which is which is fine. Um, as long as it's in line, you will get the full rating of the shackle. Choking a synthetic in any eye, whether it be an eye bolt or an eye of a hook, is a very bad practice. It's like tying a knot in a sling. And so you're going to have a, um, a failure when you do that. So that's not correct. You want to throw a shackle in there. And you can see the next picture. Well, that, that's the way to do it. Um, and it'll, you have to have full width. You get full width of the sling in the way it was intended to design. Um, to get full work and no limit. Okay. When connecting to pad eyes, uh, you want to make sure that the pad eye um, is 50 to 80 percent of the shackle width. Um, we recommend that a qualified engineer um, look at those pad eyes and, and calculate it for strengths and shear and things of that nature. Um, I always caution people, you know, just don't connect a shackle to a hole. Some welder blew through a piece of plate and made an eye. That happens all the time. Um, it is a lift point. Again, we spent thousands and thousands of dollars on the lifting equipment from top to bottom, and yet we're going to connect to some piece of plate that somebody blew a hole through with their welding machine on some um, minimal plate, and we can lose the load that way. So why would you spend all that money on the quality equipment that you have to lift safely, and then you're really not going to worry about the lift point that you're lifting from? Um, and that's common, and it's just kind of a, a backwards type of thinking. Um, that it will be safe to do, and so you, you know, it's always your weakest point in the lift that's going to fail. And lift points are, are one, so you always want an engineer to design a lift point. And to this, to right now, there really isn't any standard on lift points, um, other than you know, get somebody that's qualified that can calculate the shear strength of that steel. Um, when lifting with shackles, uh, if you're going to connect two shackles toge together, we recommend bow to bow or bow to pin. Um, po point loading of shackles. Try to use the same size or larger diameters um, when connecting to the shackle. Um, avoid point loading of sharp edges. Obviously, that's going to damage the shackle. And try to stay in line as best as you can. Don't loop slings through the eye of, of the shackle or the, or the, on the pin because that can loosen up the pin. And also, it's a very unstable load by doing that. There's, um, you know, if you have an offset center of gravity, you're not going to have much load control. Um, so really, we don't recommend that type of rigging practice. So the correct way is, is there's the proper connection. We always say bow to sling um, when you can, uh, and then you would connect your, your hook into the, the pin dial. Um, but avoid bunching. Uh, avoid too many legs, multiple legs. Again, you know, don't try to shove everything into one shackle. Use multiple shackles if you can. You may even have an oblong link, or what we call a master link, um, that you can connect the shackle pins to, and, and basically you're making a bridle assembly by doing that. So um, various ways to do that. Just as a food for thought, when, when you're connecting bridle assemblies, when you do it to a hook, you only have a maximum include angle of 90 degrees. Um, if you go beyond that, you can tip load the hook or pull the hook out. And so a, a master link gives you 120, and a shackle also gives you 120. So another reason you may want to throw a shackle over a hook uh, a master link is kind of limiting because it's tough to connect other slings to. So, but a combination of a, of a oblong link or master link and shackles. Um, basically, if your rigging doesn't look clean, it's probably wrong. It's probably bunched up. So you want to get nice, clean look to your rigging and your connections. And if it doesn't look real clean, you probably have incorrectly sized everything. So you have everything you want everything to lay proper and, and in the right orientation. And when that happens, and if you selected everything right, you shouldn't have a problem. 
when doing chokes, uh, the bow of the shackle shall be put into the bite of the choke and not the running part of the choke. So in that picture, that's the correct way. That's a, a double wrap choke on a loose bundle. And, uh, you know, it's highly recommended to do it, to have control. Anytime you are lifting loose bundles, by the way, you're going to want to have two points of connection. So in this case, I would want two slings and two double wrap chokes uh, coming in on that. And that would be not, I would never want to do a single pick on a loose bundle or, or what's called a below a center of gravity lift. Um, However, there you can see the bow is in the bite of the shackle. That kind of reduces friction a lot, and also you don't, you're not putting the pin in there, which can loosen the pin. Side loading of shackles, and this is, um, CM has produced this for years. This is now in the ASME B3026 spec, and your reduction for side loading. Um, so if the angle um, 0 to 5 degrees and in line, you're going to get 100%. From 6 degrees to 45 degrees, you're going to get 30%. Of the of of load, and then 46 to 9 degrees, 50 percent. And again, this is symmetrical loading. Obviously, if you have unsymmetrical loading, you're going to have to figure out your share of load. And once again, we caution against using round pin shackles. Those are the shackles that do not have any type of threaded connection. They're just a uh, cotter pin retainer. We rec highly recommend that you don't use those for overhead lifting. You keep those for uh, tensioning and or, uh, securement and um, towing. So again, off-center lifts, you know, you can see here shackles can twist. Uh, you know, I had another slide showing that where it was a full side load, but we, we really want to avoid that. Um, so we, we try try to get it in line as best you can. And if you can't, take your proper reductions, be on the safe side, and reduce the reduction a little bit. Or excuse me, reduce the uh, working load some based on the charts that we just showed you. Or call your manufacturer of the shackle and get that information from them. Um, you can uh, recenter it, or you, you know, some people have used washers or bushings or things of that nature to try to keep it centered. If that's not practical, then I'll take your reductions. D to D ratios. Um, so if you're going to use a wire rope, let's say you loop it through a shackle, and that D there is, let's just say, the body of the shackle. Well, if you have too small of a diameter, really you should be matching the um, shackle diameter with the same size of the rope diameter. And again, uh, if you can't, then, then you're still going to start losing work limit. But th in this case, this shows a basket sling. And in the basket sling here, um, really to use a basket sling, we would have to have at least 25 to 1, in this case 30 to 1 um, times the diameter. So big D has to be 25 to 30 times bigger than the diameter of the wire rope. If we don't achieve that, we're going to distort that wire rope, and it's going to damage it, which means it was misapplied. And so we have to pay attention to D to D ratios. If the shackle is going in the eye of the sling, then we want to match di we want to match the diameter of the wire rope to the diameter of the sh at least to the diameter shackle right here. And basically, you know, the eye is a basket, and so we want to match the diameter of the shackle to the wire rope size. I'll get to the next slide here. So here are various configurations, the one I just showed you, um, then the shackle and the eye, and then one looping through. Um, each case, you get different work. Depending on your D to D, you can get different working low limits. Um, all may seem like the same connection, but they're not. And so again, pay attention to your D to D when you're lifting. Chain also has a D to D. Um, not as much as, as the wire rope. You only need a six to one for chain. And so if you're looping chain to a, sh to a shackle, um, the diameter of the chain needs to be at least six times larger than the, the shackle that, it, that it's going around um, so that we don't damage it. And there are D2D charts. And that, that's published um, in the NECM. It's also published on our blog site, which I'll show you how to get to as well. Um, so here I'm at my at my half hour mark here, and we're going to at least really spend 10 minutes for for questions. 45 minute seminar. I um, just want to make note uh, if you're interested in any type of rigging training, you know that's just a very quick overview of shackle shackle inspections. Um, we do have another seminar coming up called Rigging with Lever Tools, and so we'll go over inspection of a lever tool and how to use lever tools properly uh, for lifting and for tensioning, and that's going to be on June 6 at the same time. Um, 11 to uh, 11.45. And if you want to um, 
learn how to become a qualified rigger. We have qualified rigger workshops, rigging gear inspection workshops. Um, we, it's a full week for the qualified rigger. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, we, we go over quite a bit of information. We test you, and we also have the ability to offer a certification test if you want to become a qualified rigger. Um, we have a hands-on facility in Tonawan in New York, again, it's between Buffalo and Niagara Falls, where we have two overhead crane systems. We lift all types of loads, plates, uh, structures, um, a variety of slings, and it really goes the, through the gamut of rigging um, and truly gives you know, everyone that takes the course, it's an eye-opener for them of what rigging is all about. And um, Everybody that takes it, I thought I knew about rigging until after the workshop, and now you know I'm, I'm fairly confident I know what I'm doing. So that we, we offer that type of training for you guys. Um, we're also involved in workshops um, throughout, throughout um, Canada, Canada, and this one we're attending in Edmonton is June 17th through 19th at the ITI Heavy Lifting Workshop. Um, and then we have also in Houston, IP, excuse me, API Offshore Lifting Conference and Exhibition July 16th to the 17th where we're present there as well. And we'll, our people are more than happy to answer any questions for you at any of these events. Well, Peter, a few Oops. questions have come in. Yes, please. One of them, I think, was about 20 minutes into the presentation. It was from Steve, and he was asking about the moment. Wouldn't the moment be the same? And I, I actually probably should have jumped in and intervened then. Steve, if you'd like to elaborate on your question a little more, um, uh, we can address that. Uh, unless, Peter, you know, you remember what he was referring to when he asked it. Yeah, he's yeah he's probably talking about the moment arm or something in bending. Actually, he said it was the hook shackle issue. On the hook shackle issue, wouldn't the moment be the same? The hook? Uh, oh, you're talking about the, you're talking if you must if he's talking about the included angle um, from 45, you know that we have the uh, 90 degree included angle, and then we also have the 120 included angle. Okay. If that's what he's talking about. Excuse me. Here's what he's saying. He said it should be a hoist ring rather than an eye bolt. Hoist ring is, is much better than an eye bolt, absolutely. Um, however, eye bolts are also used for attachment points. They're readily available in the industry. And um, I, I, told, I agree 100% that I would prefer a hoist ring over an eye bolt. However, the eye bolts are used for lifting. And you really need to know what you're doing when lifting an eye bolt. Uh, lifting by an eyebolt, um, any wrong move or you're, you're not assembled properly or you're not taking your reductions could result in a failure. Okay. Where swivel hoist rings are, are much more forgiving, um, they stay in line, they're just mu a much more safe product to, to use. And if we're pulling it off of a vertical 10-4 or a v maybe, I'll tell you what, we'll get back to that question. Okay. We will address a few others. Um, all right. Is there a proper way to secure a screw pin so it doesn't vibrate loose? Yes. Uh, you what's called a mouse. What you want to do is you want to make sure you, you fully seat that screw pin, okay, as you normally would apply it, okay, and that you know you make sure that it's fully seated. And then what you do is you want to uh, what's called a mouse tail. You want to tie there's that hole in the shackle, and so you want to take a piece of wire and tie it back to the body of the shackle. Okay. And if that's if and if that's a big concern, you might want to go to the bolt. That's where it may, may be an application as well that you may want to go to the bolt nut cutter. Okay, great, great. Um, we have another question that came in, and this was actually uh, posed by Brian on uh, on very on a LinkedIn page, LinkedIn group. Um, but his question is: Will we be offering ETCP renewal points for upcoming sessions? It's something what we can right now uh, we we haven't looked into that for our webinars, um, and it is something we will look into. And if the more we can offer and uh, provide our customers with um, continuing education credits, for those of you ETCP is the um, rigging certification for the entertainment industry, and they get continuing education credits by um, attending schools and things of that nature to keep up their certification. So. Um, in the entertainment industry, the, the more training they attend, the more points they get to uphold their certification, which is a good thing for them. So anytime we're bringing our families to uh, concerts and Disney on Ice or theaters and things like that, that, that rigging equipment that's all over the place is safe and by ETCP professionals. So we, we may not 
be directly involved in the industry, um, some of us on this call, but uh, we certainly are attending the events where that rigging is, and uh, those riggers are um, highly qualified and, and constantly looking for ways to um, get points and attend seminars. So that's something where we should look into, and, and definitely um, moving forward, I've, al I've already gotten calls from um, our corporate office saying, hey, let's do that, let's look into it and offer those. So well, that's something we're, we're going to look into for future and certainly try to offer that to our customers. Great. Um, okay, another question has come in. Does a wire rope symbol help with the DD reduction ratios? It, it helps. It, it, it's, let's put it this way. The wire rope symbols aren't rated. Um, it is a, they're more for to help with wear and abrasion and things of that, nat of that nature. Uh, but you still need to adhere. They're they're not rated. Um, I, I agree. They they sh they probably would help to some degree, um, but you still need to adhere to the D to D ratios for proper lifting. Okay. Okay. All right. Another question. We're going to take a few more. Uh, let's see. Um, drop shackles. What concerns for damage that cannot be visually in what limits are there? Well, um, you know, you can do a mag particle if you're if you're concerned if you drop the shackle and you're you're concerned that you know, there's, he's probably talking about an internal stress or a fracture internally that maybe not you can't see with the uh, naked eye. Um, in that case, you're you're looking at a, a kind of more non-destructive testing, but you're you know you know mag a mag particle testing may reveal that. Uh, I mean, some people have gone as far as X-rays and things of like that. These are these are not um, these are beyond the scope of any um, standard inspection. So there's nothing um, in the standards that are written that requires that or, or says, hey, if you, in the event you drop the shackle, you shall have this type of testing. Not, 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 none, none of that is written. But I, I agree. Um, you know, some of these these shackles can get quite large. Uh, you know, shackles that you could walk through. You know, that's how big they get. And uh, yeah, if you drop one, yeah, you certainly want to. I, I would say it's a judgmental call, and um, I, I agree. I, I would probably want to have those looked at as far you know, do a mag particle X-ray or something to that nature, knowing that that happened. Um, take the extra steps to uh, be sure that it's still safe. So hopefully, I answered that question properly. But yeah, there, there, but there's no standard or um, something that demands that. But that's okay. a it's a great question because yeah, certainly you know, you, if something gets dropped from a high height. Um, you could have did some damage to it, certainly. Okay. We have just a couple more questions we'll take, and then we'll wrap up for today because we want to make sure we don't exceed our uh, allotted time today. Um, are there concerns about having shackles painted? Um, the only, you know, we, we do we do have shackles painted at by the, you know, we paint shackles. We have painted shackles, galvanized shackles, and self-colored shackles. Uh, my only concern before you would paint a shackle that you thoroughly inspect it to be sure that are, there are no um, no nicks or anything that you're gonna that the paint could possibly hide. Um, but with that, you know, other than that, I would not lay the paint on thick. You know, a, as light of a coating of paint as you could. Uh, I'm sure they want to keep them painted for outdoor use so they don't rust, and that that's probably a, a good practice to do. Um, but before any time before you paint something, you want to thoroughly inspect it. Um, and pass the shackle and inspection, and then I would then send them out for paint or go ahead and paint them. But um, don't go crazy with with the paint. You know that you do, you do want the paint to flake off and you have for visually inspection, so that that brings up um, areas of nick gouges. You know, if you do too good of a paint job or it's too thick, you know, you, you could you definitely hide some. Okay, we're going to take just two more questions, and like I said, the rest Peter can respond directly to you individually. Um, is a stout zip tie a reasonable mouth option? Um, you know, it all depends. You know, I, you know, it all depends. I mean, it, I, I, we would do. You know, obviously, wire would be the best, but a, a, a zip tie could work. Um, but I would regularly check it. You know, that would prevent it from backing off, and then you, you could you could probably easily see if the zip tie has broken. So I would, you know, if you can do a visual. Of that of that mouse tail, and it's you know you can see that it's twisted out of place and things of that nature. Uh, again, we do recommend a, a wire, a steel wire, but uh, something's better than nothing. Again, there's no there's no standard that would say you have to use this certain type. It just other than um, 
if put in a position longer, longer than the lift or something of that nature, that you should secure the pin to the body to prevent movement of the pin. Okay, very good. All right, um, we're going to, as I said, we will take the final questions individually via email, but at this point we're going to wrap up. I just wanted to highlight a couple things before we go. First of all, um, we have a, a couple quick polling questions, and uh, we just wanted to get a little bit of feedback from all of you. Uh, just one second here. We just wanted to get a little bit of feedback from all of you on um, how you heard about our webinar. We've been using a variety of different means to communicate with you, and we'd love to find out um, how you heard about this and which of our methods are the most effective. Excellent. Thank you so much. We love to see that. Great. We appreciate that very much. It's about what I suspected, so that's excellent. Very good. As you're continuing to vote, we have one more quick polling question. All right. I am going to uh, I'm going to close this poll, and I will do the next one. Whoops. I'm sorry here. Okay. Um, are you interested in taking a hands-on rigging class? Peter has referred to a few of the offering um, the offering we have for the next few months for the rest of the year. So if you could please vote there and let us know. We'd love to see your input. Just and as they're voting on that, Gisela, I do want to say you know, these are little tidbits of uh, subjects that we do during our rigging training and that we're doing these webinars on. You know, like the next one is the lever tool. Um, you know, we, we're trying to throw these little tidbits out there to show people that, hey, there, there's a lot to rigging. Um, and I just talked 40 minutes just on a, on a shackle um, and really at a, at a fast speed. Um, and just may, you know, now let's go apply it. Let's try a different scenario so you can see how much time you can spend just on a shackle. So, um, it, it, you know, rigging training is pretty extensive um, and really it, it, it's tough to do a, a good rigging training in, in one day. Uh, really, a, a three-day hands-on rigging training is the best way to go. Okay. Everyone, thank you very much. Just a quick thing, and thanks for the feedback, Gregory. A couple points came up about the zip ties. Um, Peter, and I, I just thought we better mention these before we wrap up. Yep. Um, I'll go ahead and close that. Um, the, the point was I wouldn't use a zip tie in an outdoor application. And Brian also said that zip ties are rated but cannot be exposed to sunlight for too long. I don't know if you want to just add another quick note. No, that, you know, that's great information. And, and I'll read uh, right from the spec what it reads. is for long-term installations, bolt-type uh, shackles should be used if screw pin type shackles are used the pin shall be secured from rotating or loosening and that's all the standard says so what you use again there's nothing to say what you can and can't use so um, I, I, I probably had Brian Brian Sickles from the entertainment industry who is ETP certified rigger who has extensive knowledge in uh, outdoor rigging and so I yeah that you're, you're also hearing from an expert there that hey, there are some drawbacks for using zip ties. Yeah, they're convenient. Um, and that's why I said I, I do recommend steel is your best, you know, a steel wire is your best bet. Um, but, you know, something's better than nothing, and there's really nothing to, uh, there's really no standard. I, it's, it's best practice, you know, is what I always preach. But, oh, Brian, sure. thank, you for, thank you for that information, and, uh, yeah, that's great information. Okay, and like I yeah, said, yeah. So there you go, like zip ties, right? Rated zip ties. Yeah. There's more. I mean, there's more to rigging than you think. <laughs> we, yeah. Really, are zip ties rated? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. is. There's things to look for. Well, and, and like I said, just to wrap up today, we really appreciate your time, but we wanted to also highlight a couple things. We do have a blog where Peter is one of our main writers, but we actually have 20 authors all throughout our corporation writing on safety, material handling, and um, you know all the various things, uh, applications, um, things that will help you on the job. We also have a, um, two Twitter handles. We have one, CMCO Live, and one for our entertainment group. We're on Facebook. Just look up Columbus McKinnon Corporation. We'd love to connect with you there. After this session, since it is recorded, we will be posting it on our YouTube channel, and we'll be sending all of you a link to that. You can find us at Columbus McKinnon. We also have a LinkedIn corporate page if you'd like to have some updates there. Or last but not least, we're also on Google+. So again, thank you so much for attending. We appreciate it. And if any of you have feedback about our presentation, we'd love to have it. You can, Peter, if you can go back to our contact page, I would appreciate it. Please go ahead and send us some feedback to um, either Peter or myself. We'd love to hear it. 
And yeah, uh, you check out that blog for the shock loading. It's very interesting. And it's on, the, on our blog page. There we are. Perfect. So feel free to send us some feedback uh, to either Peter or myself or any further questions that you might have wanted to ask but couldn't during our session. Thank you very much, and we wish you uh, 